What's good everybody, I'm Yandrek and today I'm gonna take you for a deep dive into Esperka deck building. Uh, so as you all know, probably, Esperka is a deck that I've had a reasonable success in the last few months and about which I think I know a lot. Yeah, I, I'm not afraid to say, to say that I know a lot about Esperka and I think my idea on how to build it is the best way to approach it right now. Uh, so hopefully I'm gonna share all of those rules that I have right now with you today. Uh, so first of all, let's get into the list. Uh, so this is the list uh, that I've been playing for like a week now and I've, I've been liking it. Um, it differs from the list that I used to play like a couple weeks ago, uh, somewhat significantly. Uh, I basically took stuff from Wafo Tapas list uh, that I've liked about it. Uh, by the way, Wafa Tapas list, if you are not familiar with it, it's like the second popular branch of Esper list, which leans m way more into less Planeswalker stuff, more char charms, both Archmage's charms and Esper charms, uh, no verdicts, no sweepers of any kind in the main deck, no forces. And while I think this approach is a bit too extreme, I do enjoy the very powerful turn 5 play, which is Teferi into a Trim Pit Interaction. So I want to bolster this part of the deck as well. And that's why I changed my usual 3 Jaces to Teferis into 2 Jaces and 3 Teferis. And then cut a main deck uh, verdict, cut one force, and added a bunch more of 2 mana interaction, as you can see. Before I was playing 2 mana leaks, uh, or 3 mana leaks, and no Drown, no Logic Knot. Now I have both 1 Drown and 1 Knot. Uh, I do have additional copy of Chaos Guile in the main deck as well, so you can go for like turn 6 Teferi Guile more often. And over like, uh, overall, I think this approach is pretty nice. Uh, another thing that's more subtle about this this kind of uh, this kind of style of the, this deck is that without Verdict in the main deck, you don't have any, or without Verdict in the 75 in general, you don't have any double white um, requirements, which allows you to build the mana base a bit more freely. Uh, and I think this is something that shouldn't be underestimated, but is, yeah, is often overlooked. Uh, so first of all, we're gonna di dive into mana, because I think mana is a very, very overlooked aspect of building decks. And this is, in my opinion, the single most important guideline taken from the single most important article ever, ever written about magic, which is Frank Carsten's article about how much color sources you need to cast your spells. Uh, you can check Frank Carsten's articles on Channel Fireball. Uh, you can watch a VOD on Magic Twitch channel about, about math from yesterday, that is, uh, Thursday, I believe, April 29th. Um, and this video was actually super helpful. Uh, I think to new, it's basically the same stuff that he is going over in his article, or in his articles in general. Uh, but he also explains a lot of the, uh, those concepts if you are less uh, familiar with it, or if you are less to maths, then I think you can you can check it out, and it's a very it's a very simple uh, explanation of those concepts, and yeah, I couldn't recommend it high enough. So, after those guidelines are fulfilled, I am focusing on mostly two things. Um, and A is making mana as painless as possible, and B is squeezing some loot utility lands. And the side note on utility lands, I've I've been talking about it for many weeks now, maybe even many months, but when I'm evaluating uh, utility lands, first of all, I think you have to look at the land side of this and then the spell side. So for example, if you're playing a man land, sure, having a, th this creature is nice and flashy, it, it's, well, the 4-4 flying creature is better than Scry 2 on your land, right? But the Azarius Guildgate aspect of Celestial Colonnet is much, much worse than the one color check land of the castle Lantress or Castle under Ardenvale. Uh, and those aspects, those land aspects, will come up every single time you draw this card, and the uh, the spell side aspect won't. So I think it's 
way way more important to to look at the land side and that's why i don't like manlands because most common casualty casualty of manlands are actually the owners of manlands uh, when they needed an untapped source uh, and they they can't do it because they drew celestial component of the top instead of an untapped land for their verdict or whatever uh, with eldraine castles you actually have access to a really really nice utility land and the opportunity cost of playing it's way way lower than manland so please just don't, don't play top lands in your deck and uh, additional note is that uh, in the article uh, frank carson goes over how much you should factor cantrips into into your color sources because obviously with cantrips it's it's much it's a bit easier to cast your spells and i think a playset of opts which is the only country in this deck should roughly count as a one and a half to two mana sources for any two plus mana spells so obviously if you want to calculate how many sources you have for turn one fatal push you, you can't use opt because well on turn one you have to cast the set uh, fatal push but for anything other than this fatal push uh, and two three four or five mana spells I would count up as one and a half to two mana sources. Also, the only guideline that I think you sh you can't really you can't really fulfill is the or it's not worth fulfilling. You can do it, but I don't think it's worth it. Is the turn one 14 sources for fatal push, which is uh, more than 90% to cast it, but 13 uh, 13 sources for fatal push is 89.9% which is basically 90%, and I think it's good enough uh, as, a, as a requirement, so when I'm building the mana base, I am using 13 sources instead of 14 sources for turn 1 removal spells. Uh, so, in the, my list, and in most Esper lists, the most uh, constraining uh, mana requirements are those, which is Fatal Push, 13 sources, as I've said before, we can look back. It says precisely it's 92.1, but we are happy with 89.9. Uh, so 30 sources for Fatal Push, uh, Supreme Verdict slash Damnation is 17 and 16 sources respectively. Because when you are evaluating multicolor spells, Frank Carson recommends adding one peep to every requirement. So if you have Supreme Verdict, which is double white, uh, Usually for like two CC spells, you need 16 sources, but for Verdict, he likes adding this one because sometimes you will have a blue-white dual that will need to cast the blue side of Verdict. So yeah, that's a general like guideline. I think in this deck you can largely ignore the blue requirement and just count it as a two white-white because of every single... There's only one non blue white land in your deck and there is no chance that you will have more than one non blue white land in, on board so you can actually probably just take 16 and also uh, on why those numbers are like going up and up is the guideline for how how high of a percentage you want to have by Karsten is the percentage you are aiming for is 89% plus the uh, converted mana cost of the card you want to play. So it's not that big of a deal if... It's less big of a deal if you are missing turn 1 push than missing turn 4 verdict. That's why you have uh, that's why you have 90% for turn 1 and you have 93% for turn 4, 95, uh, 94% for turn 5 and so on. Uh, and the last requirement is Archmage's Charm, uh, which is quite easy to fulfill when you are playing Esper and you are not playing, um, and you are not playing uh, Field of Ruins, because basically only two two lands in the deck doesn't tap for uh, or don't tap for blue on their own, which is basic swap and basic uh, planes, and as long as you are playing Filter lands. I think you you are safe with this, even without counting filter lands as more than one sources. Uh, it's still twenty three sources precisely for Archmage. So I think it's good enough. And 
about filter lands, my rule of thumb is that I like one filter land in my deck for every non blue producing land. So when I'm adding Godless Shrine because I want main deck sweeper, I am adding another filter land to, to make this Archmage's Charm a bit easier to cast. Also, about Fatal Push, uh, one more remark. I think this is the most critical piece, and this is where a lot of people skimps on their mana sources. This is my biggest beef with Waffles mana. It's not even playing Celestial Colonnade, even though I think it's not very good. It's how rare you will be, of, or how often will you miss. I, I believe the last Waffle mana has either 10 or 11 sources for Fatal Push. So you are missing either in 20 or in 15 or 16 percent of the time you are missing the turn one Fatal Push. If you are playing 10 and it's 20 percent, that's twice as often as with 13. And that's a very very big difference. And that's one of the reasons I love River of Tears. Uh, so a lot of people are ridiculing this land, I know that, and I don't really get why. And this is a turn one source for Fatal Push and an untapped land later on. This is basically what, what you want. So once again, I think F turn one Fatal Push is the biggest bottleneck on mana uh, in these three color decks, because you just can't jam a bunch of Dark Seek Shores and stuff like this to, to cast them early on. And just River of Tears is just the right card for the job. And the most common argument against River of Tears is that you can't cast black spells off of it in your on your opponent's turn. And that, that's true, but I don't think that matters. Because when I'm building the mana base, I'm counting River of Tears as only blue producing land. I'm not counting this as a black source. This is only blue source. Except for turn one fatal push and turn four damnation. Uh, for everything else, I'm just counting it as my only mono blue land, and I'm not counting it for, I don't know, turn two Drown in the Lock, turn three Esper Charm, turn three Karius Guile. For all of those purposes, this is a mono blue land, and it's only a black land for turn one Fatal Push and turn four Damnation. I think this is a pretty good approximation of River of Tears. Obviously, from time to time, it will bite you. For example, if you want to play Archmage's Charm on your turn three, instead of your opponent turn 3 for some reason, but those cases are pretty rare, and overall the upside of consistent Fatal Push on turn 1 is much, much higher, especially with a lot of prowess decks in the format, against which you just want to push on 1, then interact on 2 as well. So yeah, I do think that this is uh, this is a just an optimal land, and uh, in general about mana, I think that a lot of people are saying, Oh, I hate River of Tears. I hate something, something. But it's not about how you feel, really, in my opinion. Because while I can agree that when it comes to like spells, you can have different reads on the meta game and what's good and what's not good. But once you have a set of spells that you want to play, figuring out mana is actually a solvable problem, like mathematical problem. It's just maths. There is an optimal mana base to support any given set of spells. And you may like it, or you may not like it, but this is just how it works. Of, of course you can of course you can argue about what are the uh, criterias that you, are, that you are choosing when you are building your mana base. So for example, you can argue whether 50% or 90% probability to hit your spells or your mana for your spells is good enough. Uh, you can argue that uh, some mulligan decisions are influencing those criteria a bit different. Uh, you, you can make a lot of assumptions. I think Frank's assumptions are very, very reasonable. So that's why I'm using his tables. And it's just, it's fine if you want to take some other, some other assumptions. If you are, for example, saying, okay, I think that 85% is good enough for me. Okay, sure. It might be good enough for you, and I won't argue with that. But it's just when I say, "Oh, I don't like this land. Can I play something else?" Without any deeper, deeper like reasoning for it, it's just not correct, and you are you doing yourself a disservice by just 
writing this lambda off in my opinion. Uh, so this is uh, the mana that I'm running. First column is obviously just fetch land, so it's basically a free color land. Then I have black sources, which adds to a cool 15 together, uh, excluding uh, second rings and drowned catacombs, you have 13 on turn one. Then you have five uh, white sources, which add up to, adds up to 13 white sources, which is good enough for any, any single white card that is more, more expensive than one mana, or even for one mana spells. But some of those lands come top for uh, on turn one, namely Glacier Fortresses and Mystic Gates. So it's actually like 11 turn one white sources, but I'm not playing any one mana white cards. So that's one of the reasons why the mana build base is built that way. And this mana basically su uh, supports everything that I mentioned before. So it supports turn one Fatal Push. It has the 13 coveted 13 sources that I've been talking about so many times. Then it supports Black Instance that I've been talking about before. So it can support, it supports uh, Kaya's Guile and stuff like this because you have still 14 sources excluding River of Tears. Then it supports Archmage's Charm for obvious reasons and it supports the nation. So everything that I've been talking about is supported by this mana base and you can still squeeze in two castle ventures, which is a pretty good late game card. It's l relatively painless as as f for like free mana, free color mana base. Uh, you obviously have eight eight fetch lands. You have four shock lands, but I don't think you can skip skimp on them. Uh, maybe you can add second river of tears instead of second water uh, third water grave, but I do think that this mana also has a nice ratio of fetchables to fetch lands. Because it has nine fetchables and eight fetch lands with no field of ruins, I think it's pretty okay. And overall, I think this mana is just the best mana I can play with this set of spells. So, as far as spells go, these are what I would consider a core spell package for for this deck. Uh, you could argue two things. Uh, first of all, that some higher number of charms, either Archmage's charm or Esper charms, uh, should be core. But I could see the world in which I want, for example, to main deck for Chaos Guiles. And some more cheap interaction. And then you just don't have slots for Archmage's Charms. And the second thing that I think you can re relatively uh, reasonably argue is for Snapcaster Mage. But once again, I do think that uh, the fourth copy is, while also very often it's very good, Sometimes I can imagine, for example, a very Lava Dart heavy format against which you don't want that much Snapcaster Mage because it's actually a free mana spell. So if you want to be lower to the ground, I I can understand why you don't want for, for Snapcaster Mage. Uh, as far as walkers go, I do like two and two walker split, and I wouldn't play and really play a third copy of either of them uh, before the second copy of the other one. Sorry for that. Uh, so I know Waffle played three Teferi's one days and then he went to three Teferi zero Jaces. But I do like the three, two Teferi's two Jaces baseline because they really work well together. And if you don't, if you have this more balanced split, you are getting into the situation where you have two Planeswalkers more often. And one turn with two Planeswalkers should basically lock up the game. Sometimes you will lose with one of those Planeswalkers on the board, of course, but if you manage to play both of them, it's very, very hard to lose. And that's one of the reasons that, that I like it. Um, and also both of, both of those have a bit different stra strengths, so... Yeah. And then these are the flex slots uh, that are currently in the deck. And I just like this selection of cards once again. Logic not drawn in the lock plays more into Teferi Hero of the Minaria to untap two lands on turn five, which is uh, what I like. Uh, Chaos Guide is pretty great right now. Cryptic Command is also quite close to the core, but I can see playing like Spring Verdict instead of it. Uh, Spell Snare is another card that um, that is somewhat disliked by many people, but I do think that having the opportunity to 
interact with Fling Discovery or Cathartic Reunion or another two drop on on the draw is very important. And with Force of Negation in the format, you can just pitch your dead your dead spells if they are blue to force. So that's very convenient. As far as sideboard goes, uh, as you can see, I'm reinforcing the Teferi plus Chimp interaction pattern. The bulk of the sideboard cards are two mana, uh, nine of them, and eight of them are instants. Uh, so obviously you can't Teferi and just then rest in peace in, in, in the end step. Uh, but you can cast the remaining eight cards like that. And I think Go for the Throat is a card that's somewhat overlooked as well. It's pretty close to Terminate. And it can kill artifacts, okay. But it kills two threads that are most punishing creatures that often resolve early on that you can't push, which are uh, Storming Entity and Reality Smasher. You can also count Primeval Titan. But you want to counter this, like, Primeval Titan already resolving, it's, like, if it resolves, it's already kind of punishing, even if you manage to go for the throat it. And also we have uh, Eater Gas to deal with it. I would still bring go for the throat against uh, Amulet, but I do think that uh, being able to deal with Smasher and Storming is, like, the, the key, the key advantage of, of go for the throat. Uh, as far as Vanishing Verse goes, uh, it has been be decent so far, and is likely a better option right now than Celestial Purge, unless you really need to kill like Lurus or Renan 6 or Clothis. And but you have other stuff to kill them, like you have Eliminate for Renan 6, you have Ethergas for Clothis, you have a plethora of removal spells for Lurus. So I, I do think that the uh, the versatility of Vanishing Verse is is better because it's just it just builds on top of those answers you already have and it gives you some nice redundancy. So with Vanishing Verse, you have three removal spells that can kill Primeval Titan for two mana. But also you have three, uh, three cards that can kill Blood Moon for two mana. Or you have three cards that can kill Storming Entity for two mana and so on, so on. So it's a very nice, uh, very versatile card. Uh, Vendillion Click is my go-to anti-control slash combo slash big mana threat. And can be probably replaced with Mentor or Teferi Time Raveler if you like those options more. I do think that Click is better than those cards. That's why I'm running it. But yeah, I can, I can understand why, why you would like to run some other cards. And uh, lastly, Damnation. I like at least one Sweeper in the 75, and would possibly play another one uh, because uh, I do like having this powerful reset button to draw towards against creature decks. I think having zero is kinda weak, and I've played zero in my first iteration of this version of Asperka, and it felt pretty bad. And yeah, I, I wouldn't go to zero once again, but I think one is okay-ish, and there is nothing you I do want to cut, maybe, like rest in peace, but I'd rather be safe than sorry about uh, against Dredge. And have this rest in peace. And without a main deck sweeper, that's also pretty nice. Uh, I've talked about that before. I think it's okay to play Damnation in order to get better mana, which is Third Water Grave over uh, Godless Shrine and Second Castle Ventures. Because if you're playing a main deck sweeper, you do want this flexibility of being pitchable to Force of Negation, which Supreme Verdict has. And also, Uncounterability is pretty nice. Uh, and out of the sideboard, there are not that many decks that you have counter spells and you want sweepers against. I guess Blue Red Prowess is the big one because they do run spell pierce fairly often. Uh, but I think it's okay and it's better to make it's better to make this this mana uh, better because if you if you play Verdict you probably need to stretch your mana a bit for it and then from time to time you won't be able to cast it. And would like to go back to what uh, to Godless Shrine, but overall, I think the the pros of playing the nation outweighs the top cons. That's why I'm doing it. And this is all I have for you today. Uh, as a reminder, I am streaming PTQ on Monday, uh, which is May third, uh, nearest Monday, and I will be playing this seventy five. I will also play this seventy five in challenges this week. I think if I'm playing them. 
and I feel pretty good about it. And I do hope that it will go well, especially the PTQ since there has been quite some time since I've had like a nice long stream and I'm looking forward to Monday. So that's all from me today. I hope you enjoyed this type of content and let me know if you have any suggestions on how I could improve and stuff like this. And yep, that's it. Take care and bye bye.